Uh, I will be talking about <coughs> Project Calico. Uh, just, uh, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with Project Calico. Oh, there are some people. Uh, are there any who use the eBPF data plane? If I, oh, there are some. So, <laughs> so uh, in this talk, I will be uh, primarily talking about the eBPF data plane uh, that drives uh, Calico in recent years but I'll be also talking a little bit more broadly about Calico. So uh, for those who, for a few of you who are not familiar with Calico, Calico <coughs> provides container and networking uh, uh, security and it these days primarily runs in uh, Kubernetes, so it serves as a CNI for Kubernetes. When you install Kubernetes, you don't have networking and you need uh, some networking plugins, so Calico can be one of your uh, plugins. But Calico predates Kubernetes, and we, as we were just talking with Josh here, it started uh, way back then uh, when with OpenStack and uh, other technologies, but now it's primarily focused on uh, Kubernetes, uh, but it doesn't provide just the networking and a networking plugin. What is more important, it provides you with some network policy model, uh, which uh, is yet another plugin that you need for your Kubernetes because Kubernetes have their own policy model, which is actually younger than the, the policy model of Calico. And uh, you need something that actually powers that policy model. So Calico has its own policy model, which is a superset of what you can get in Kubernetes, but also implements everything, as I said, superset, so it implements everything that uh, Kubernetes model uh, asks you to do. Uh, it is essentially a control plane that takes your policies and observes the cluster and puts the things together and puts it into a data plane that executes. Uh, Calico uh, has several uh, data planes or can be used in different environments. As I said, it uh, started way before Kubernetes and it started with just regular Linux, so it can run on regular Linux in IP tables mode where all the data plane is provided by the Linux and the Linux kernel. So Calico goes and writes the IP tables rules and uh, the Linux uh, executes. Uh, I will be focusing today mostly on the eBPF data plane, which is, uh, which executes in the kernel, but the kernel only provides the environment for the data plane, but the code and uh, the data plane itself is provided by the project Calico. And we also support and offer uh, a couple more data planes. Uh, Cisco contributed uh, VPP, the vector packet processing framework, uh, which is based on Intel's user space DPDK toolkit. And that was a couple of weeks ago, uh, a blog post about uh, how it works and uh, what are the benefits. So you can go to the Calico Projects webpage and, and read more about that. And uh, we also run in Windows environment. So if you have a cluster that has Windows nodes, Calico can run there, Calico can implement the policies. And what is pretty cool is that Windows is experimenting with eBPF, which is compatible with the Linux eBPF, and so we experiment with that as well. Uh, so Calico was supporting the Linux and IP tables since ever. Uh, this is where it grew up. Uh, I'll take questions after. Yeah, I'll, I'll take questions after. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, so why is there a need for a new Linux-based data plane? Uh, we started this journey some years ago and we kind of offer it as like a stable, or quite stable platform uh, for about three years now. Uh, but let me reflect first on the IP tables and why we uh, need uh, a new option. So the benefit of IP tables is that it's well understood. I think like 
everybody came across IP tables at some point. It's been around for, I don't know, 25 years. And it is kind of human readable as much as <laughs> IP tables can be human readable. Simply, you can dump the rules. You can kind of read them. You can kind of see what uh, the rules mean. And so when QProxy writes the rules into the IP tables, you can kind of go and debug like uh, what uh, QProxy meant. And when Calico writes in the policies, you can go and kind of see what the policies do and how they are executed. And Linux does the rest of the heavy lifting. It does all the routing. It handles all the protocols, all the corner cases, and all the things that need lots of tweaking over those 20, 25 plus years. So this is very robust and very well tested. Right? But there are also some downsides. Uh, it doesn't necessarily scale. Uh, the way the IP tables are designed, there is lots of ON uh, searches. And if you have uh, a cluster where, say, you have thousands of services, and there are such clusters, and we may question the decisions behind that, but if you have uh, lots of services, and some of the services are happen to be at the end of the list, they take a hit, it is also not extendable. So if you want to change how the IP tables behave, uh, you would need to change the kernel, and that's uh, not easy to do. You would need to write a plugin. Your customers may, do not, may not want to run those plugins, and it's not uh, super safe. And sometimes even like a simple thing, like if you ask IP tables, give me packets that have the same source as the destination, it's a little tricky to do. It's not impossible, but a little tricky. Uh, the next thing is, it is a shared resource. So as I said, Kubernetes are writing through QProxy into the IP tables, and Calico is writing into the IP tables, and some of your other tools may be writing into the IP tables. And for that, <coughs> we uh, everybody needs to kind of take care of the consistency, and the rules are being read and written back and forth. And uh, that's not super convenient. It also takes your CPU time. So <laughs> why to use uh, a new data plane? Uh, one of the reasons is better scalability of services. So really, if you have uh, thousands of services in your cluster and you switch from ON to O1 uh, hashing, then you get a, you get a boost. Uh, you may get lower latency because of uh, how packets are now shuffled through the kernel, and I will touch on that later on. Uh, QProxy becomes part of the data plane or part of uh, the single uh, kind of ecosystem. And therefore, there is no uh, clash on the shared resources. And it gives you the option to implement new features, which, say, we would not be able to get to like upstream Kubernetes, or we would have to wait for that. So kind of being the lord of the one thing is pretty nice. So uh, let me, for, before I dive into the details, kind of uh, give an overview of what actually eBPF is. Some of you probably heard Natalie this morning talking about uh, eBPF, so she already touched on that. So eBPF is, in fact, kind of like a virtual machine running inside the kernel, but the virtual machine in the Java sense, where it takes code, a byte code from users, and executes that code, and it does it safely. And uh, safely means that the code is verified by the kernel so that it doesn't do anything that would be harmful for the kernel, so it doesn't access memory outside of uh, what would be allowed. It finishes in real time, and it's sandboxed. means that it can't really touch what the kernel doesn't allow it to touch. Also, uh, it only runs in certain places in the kernel that are what, what we call hooks. And those hooks are in well-defined places in the kernel. And in those hooks, the code can ask the kernel to do stuff on its behalf, but only through well-defined API. And certain things you can do in some hooks and certain things you can't. So 
it is very flexible tool, but is also safe and allows us to actually run in kernel mode, in kernel code on customers or users' side without the customers to be afraid of like us causing uh, any harm. I'm sorry? Uh, like, what it means, the eBPF? Yeah, the E stands for extended, and BPF is the Berkeley packet filler, but these days it doesn't really mean that much. <laughs> uh, yeah, today eBPF is just a name and doesn't have much to do with the ancient uh, BPF, although it can do the same stuff sometimes. So, uh, there are two places where we hook the, the eBPF code primarily. Uh, one is at the devices and the other place is at system calls. So the code that you attach to the devices and you can do it on the ingress and egress side of the device uh, allows us to parse the packets and modify the packets. Uh, we make console routing and we can accept drop or forward the packet. So when we forward the packet, we can do it from a device to another device, which effectively means that the IP tables and majority of the network uh, stack in kernel is completely bypassed. And then we can also hook into some system calls. Uh, Natalie was talking about it this morning already, but there are certain network related uh, system calls which allow us to hook in a slightly different way. So we can't just read the arguments of the calls. We can also modify the arguments of the call before the rest of the kernel processes those uh, arguments. So when the application tries to connect and uh, it wants to connect to location A, we can intercept that and say, yeah, no, you really want to connect to in, uh, location B and you probably already know where it's going, but I will talk about it a little bit uh, later. So in the generic design of the data plane, when you look at the single node in your cluster, it has a bunch of devices, it has a bunch of uh, pods that are connected to uh, the host namespace through uh, devices. And we attach our BPF programs to the ingress and egress of all the devices that we are interested in. And when a packet comes in, our program uh, has a chance to process the packet and decide where the packet should go next and can forward it to a pod or say we are using an IP IP overlay so we process the IP IP packet first, we say, okay, got, got to go to the tunnel interface and that tunnel, the program at the tunnel interface has a chance to say where else uh, the packet should continue, right? They, but when you use Kubernetes, you're probably interested in using services because of simplicity. So when a packet, uh, when, a, when a pod or process in, in a pod wants to connect to a service, uh, how do we decide where where stuff should go. Previously, that was decided by uh, Kube proxy as it wrote the rules into the IP tables. But now, we're bypassing the IP tables largely. So <laughs> who does that? We have to do it. The eBPF data plane has to resolve the services. So let me zoom in at uh, the devices. Uh, when you connect a pod to the host network namespace, you usually use a wet device, virtual Ethernet, where one end is in the pod, kind of representing the E0 in the pod, and then you have the other end in the host network namespace. And uh, if you use Calico, it, those devices would be named Kali something, but Calico can also work with uh, different CNIs. So for instance, in, if you install an EKS and if you use the native uh, EKS CNI, these would be called ENI something. So when a packet comes into the pod, just before uh, we go and check whether there is a contract entry, if, it, they, if there is, then we know that it has been already seen and it's been vetted and we just let it in. Otherwise, we run policy. If it's accepted, then we uh, create a contract and uh, we let the, uh, let the packet in, otherwise we drop. When a process is sending packets out of a pod 
And if we don't have a contract entry, it means that we haven't seen it yet. We also have to check whether it's actually going to a service, and then we have to pick uh, the uh, the back end uh, the, for the service, and uh, then the rest is pretty much the same. Then we have the host network interfaces. Uh, those are the interfaces, the physical interfaces that connect your node uh, to the outside world. And it's a little similar uh, to what you can see in the pod. We also have to match against contract, but we also have to resolve the services because we may have external traffic hitting node ports. And if we have something that's hitting node ports, we also have to decide whether it, the packet stays on, the, on this node, or whether we have to forward it to, uh, to a different node. So that's our responsibility. Previous is being done uh, by, by QProxy. What we also do at the host endpoint is we run host policies. That's an extension on top of uh, uh, the Kubernetes policy model. It's something that is offered by Calico Global Policies. So we also let you police like what comes into your node, not just into what comes into uh, your pods. On the egress from the node, it's very similar, but another thing that differs on uh, host uh, interfaces is that we can also hook our programs into XGP. XGP is yet another acronym from the BPL world, which means Express Data Plane, and that allows us to run code super close to the hardware on the ingress into your node. And if you have fancy network cards, uh, I think there's one vendor that has those network cards, you can actually push the code all the way down to the network card. And what it allows us to do is to implement untracked policies. That's yet another feature that Calico has uh, on top of the Kubernetes. So say you wanna protect your nodes from some DOS attacks uh, without like running out of resources and you want to do it as soon as possible so you don't waste computing uh, power on on the attack. So you can create an untracked policy and that is pushed almost, and in some cases, all the way to the hardware and uh, those packets are dropped uh, very soon and it's so effective that we actually use this also when, when you use Calico in IP tables mode. So in IP tables mode, if you have untracked policies, they will be actually uh, executed in eBPF on the XGP hook. So far, we were, I was talking uh, about, uh, about uh, pods and how we hook into uh, the traffic through the devices, but then we have host network processes. And for host network processes, there is no other way than to go through IP tables. Packets enter IP tables in the output chain and then the IP tables decide <coughs> and the rest of the stack decide where the packets should go. But where should they go if there is no queue proxy, right? So this is the time when we actually use the system calls and we hook into the system call. So when the system call is executed, we can decide that instead of going to the service IP, the packets will actually go to, uh, or the connection uh, will go to the uh, backend. So uh, the network will never see a packet with the host, uh, uh, sorry, the, the network will never see a packet with the service IP. Actually, all the packets will be pod to pod IPs, which saves on processing because you don't have to translate every packet and also saves on the occupancy of a contract table because instead of needing two entries for incoming and outgoing traffic, we just have a one simple simple entry. And this doesn't only work for the host network processes. This is a C group based hook and we can hook every uh, process uh, in the system, in the cluster. And it works both for TCP and UDP. So then if you look back at how we send packets out of a pod, if we have this feature enabled, which is enabled by default because we require it for the host network uh, processes, we can save ourselves some hassle uh, when we are uh, resolving uh, every single packet and translating every single packet in sleeving pods. So, 
so far I was talking about intra cluster traffic, but then we have also traffic that is coming uh, from outside. And one way or another is going to end up as a node port. So a client connects to the node port and then uh, the data plane needs to decide where the packet is going to stay on the same node and be delivered to the uh, pod on the same node, which is a simple case, or whether it's gonna be forwarded. So in the IP tables world, when you forward a packet, you have to do uh, SNAP because you have to make kind of sure that there is a way for the packets to come back and get translated back to the client, right? So it is SNAP <coughs> with the source IP of the node that forwards the packets, then it reaches the destination node and then is forwarded to the, uh, to the destination backend pod. But then you lose the source IP of the client, which is, Pretty inconvenient, right? So imagine that you're writing a policy that says like a set of clients can connect to your front end or your load balancer can connect to a front end, right? And then the policy sometimes works and sometimes doesn't and then you start scratching your head and you start refining the policy then you realize that you pretty much have to allow every node to connect to your front end, right? That's uh, it's not super, uh, super nice. Then you have, instead of like a precise policy, then you have like a wide open policy. Uh, in the classic Kubernetes, you can deal with that by setting the traffic uh, policy be equal to local, by default it's a cluster. What it means is that when traffic hits your node port, then it will only forward it to the local pods, right? So this is simple. Uh, the IPs of the client will be preserved because there is no forwarding, there is no SNET, and you have some lower latency because it's not being forwarded, but only if you hit the right node. So if you have a bunch of nodes and uh, the, the load balancer is not clever enough, you may or may not hit the right node and then the connections may or may not uh, go through. So in the eBPF-based data plane, we have a different approach. First, SNAT is not super easy to do in eBPF because it is a little tricky, not impossible, but tricky to reserve ports that would not conflict with possible processes running on the same node. So what we do instead is, yeah, client connects, we turn around the packet, but then we put the packet in a tunnel. Uh, that is super simple in eBPF and we've picked VXLAN as the tunnel of our choice, but you can do uh, a different tunnel. The packet gets to the destination node and we take the packet out of the tunnel. It's the original packet, so we have the client source. And then we deliver the packet to the, uh, to the pod. So that allows you to not worry about the external traffic policy unless you care about the extra hop uh, and the latency associated with the extra hub because we always preserve the source IP. That allows you to do simpler configuration and more precise policies. But to add some like a shades of gray in between the, the white and black of uh, external policy local and cluster, we also have yet another mode. We have to forward the packet to the right node to reach the, the right pod, but because we have the source IP of the, uh, of the client, we can forward the packet back straight to the client. Uh, this is a, what is called direct server return, DSR, and it's a little dependent on what your network permits because those packets are suddenly coming from the second node with the first node's IP. So not every uh, network fabric will allow it, but for instance, in Azure AKL, that works great. Uh, so we have a third mode, which uh, allows you to uh, forward, but with smaller latency. Uh, the underlying network has to allow it, and you don't have to worry that much about configuration. But as I said, uh, use uh, Azure as an example, uh, the Azure health probes are coming from uh, a set IP and the DSR doesn't really work to go to back to that IP. 
So you can opt out from the DSR uh, for that IP. And then you can have a mix of modes depending on what, what your needs really are. But eBPF, all is great, but the devil is always in the detail. Uh, so with the load balancing at the connect time, uh, I'm not sure whether someone has been to the, uh, to the service mesh presentation yesterday. If you have a service mesh, you, the service mesh wants to know what's the service and not what's the backend that we pick. So if you use this connect time load balancing, then it doesn't really work with a uh, with mesh. But if you already, oh, you can turn it off because if you already have a mesh, you probably don't worry about shaving off uh, nanoseconds. Uh, when we have UDP, you can have connected UDP and we make the decision once. But if you have UDP that is using send message, then we would have to make the uh, re uh, service resolution for every packet. So in these cases, we maintain uh, per client affinity, which would uh, be exactly the same if we were not using this connect load balancing. And uh, we avoid ways kind of spraying the entire cluster if your application is uh, sending lots of packets. Sometimes it may not be a problem, but sometimes you care. And then the application selects backend, but the backend may die. And then your UDP application will be sending stuff uh, uh, to the dead backend. Uh, TCP can resolve those uh, broken connections, but UDP can't. So you can turn off this CTLB thing, uh, and you can also turn it off only for UDP, because usually DNS is the primary use case here. So you have a cluster that reshuffles DNS a lot, you, you would probably notice it. Uh, I said previously that we kind of need this connect-based load balancing for, uh, for host network applications, but what we can do is, and what we do is we can uh, insert a wet pair, a dummy wet pair into the host network address space, and then everything that comes from uh, those applications is routed through that web pair and then we can hook it through eBPF uh, and then make a decision. But this everything is kind of like the nuts and bolts of the internals of the data plane and typically shouldn't be really uh, visible to a user. But as we use uh, the, uh, as, as more users are adopting this eBPF data plane for various reasons, uh, what is their perspective actually? So what they like about it, it is, it is fast. And it has new features. But it's a bit confusing for the, for the user because things now work differently than they used to. For instance, it is hard to verify for the user, a knowledgeable user, who digs into the data plane, like whether the policies, when, which are specified as a YAML, are actually translated into exactly the same thing that, that the user meant. Previously, you could read the IP table rules, you can't do it now. Linux contract is mostly bypassed, so there are some users that have tools that monitor the contract, and suddenly they see a connection with a single packet, for instance, uh, which are current cases. And that's confusing. Some of the connections, most of the connections you should not even see in the, in the Linux contract. And it's also hard to verify that the services are implemented the way the user would uh, understand. And there are also third party IP table rules and these are bypassed, so it may break uh, some legacy setups. Uh, two, sorry. To provide some more insights into the data plane, Calico provides a tool called Calico BPF, but it's also accessible straight with the Calico nodes. So if you exec into the Calico node on a particular node, you can execute uh, those commands that will let you inspect the internals of the data plane, the state of the data plane. Let me start uh, with policies. So 
as I said, Calico is a control plane that observes the entire cluster and takes your policy that you specify through your YAML file into uh, rules that should be executed by the data plane. Previously, in the IP tables world, all these rules were written into IP tables, so you kind of had them in a single place. Uh, these days, with eBPF, it's kind of split across each individual endpoint, so each endpoint carries the rules that apply to that endpoint. And those rules are not just like human readable uh, rules. These are actually compiled into eBPF program. Uh, that when, uh, when we parse the packet, we kind of call into that program, the program decides, okay, is it acceptable or not, and gives us a return value, and then we uh, process the rest of the packet based on that. The catch is that it is bytecode, it's a byte blob, and you can go and you can get it out, and you can disassemble that, but that's not human readable, right? So now with the Calico BPF tool, you can go and ask, like, give me the policies in some human readable form. The output looks uh, like that snippet, as that would be more above and below, but it shows the information that you will get. It gives you the, the rule and the policy that the rule belongs to. That's something you would see in your, uh, in your YAML. It also shows you the action that is being executed and some more human readable uh, uh, description of what the rest of the code is doing. So you can kind of go through the code and, uh, and verify that the policies are doing what, what you had in mind. And that's also the actual uh, disassembled code, which is <laughs> uh, just for those who uh, are crazy enough. Uh, what uh, some of the policies don't have encoded IP, uh, IP addresses, because if you have a service that has like tens or hundreds of backends, that would be, uh, that would be just silly to put it in like a list of addresses in the code. So what we use is what we call IP sets. We borrow the term from IP tables because it's really like just a set of IPs. So the application, uh, the, the policy down will show you like what selector uh, applies the rule and it also shows you, uh, sorry, and it also shows you which IP set is used by this program. And then you can go and use the Calico BPF tool and that IP set identifier to dump uh, the IPs, again, to verify whether, whether Calico understands uh, the, the cluster in the same way as you understand it. The next thing is verifying how the services uh, look like. And anecdotally, I just had uh, a debugging session yesterday with one user, and this piece of information proved to be super useful. Uh, we have two tables. We have a table for front end and a table for back end, which is not surprising. The output kind of groups the front ends and the back ends together, shows you what's the service IP, what's the protocol, what's the, what's the port, and then it also gives you the information about how many, how many uh, uh, back ends are local to the node and how, ma how many are uh, remote. It was exactly the piece of information which I used yesterday when I was debugging and and uh, the user was like, oh, it's not picking the backend on, on that node. So I just dumped that and it's like, yeah, there's no local, local backend. Uh, in fact, it kind of discovered a bug in Kubernetes because Kubernetes were not telling us uh, the right information or not the whole information. So then you also have service ID and the backend ID. And uh, as in this example, you can see that some of the services endpoints are in multiple services. I mean, these are just different flavors of the same service. You have a service IP for the uh, service and you have a node port uh, and you also have a meta entry uh, for the other nodes uh, for the same node port. So when you dump this, you can also verify that really the, the, data, uh, the, the data plane is programmed the way that you want it to be programmed. 
the another thing uh, is routing. As I said, uh, the eBPF data plane can uh, console routing of, of Linux, but it also needs to have some understanding of the cluster because it's kind of outside the Linux. So this is routes as we understand how the cluster looks like. So it gives you like what cider goes to remote pods and what cider goes to local host. And for the local pods, it tells you to what interface it is uh, attached so that Calico when it sees a packet to the local pod can go and straight pick right interface and send it straight to that uh, interface. <coughs> because Calico implements the services, because Kubernetes, Kubernetes is not there, we also have to translate all the packets and we also have to track what the decisions for the services and what uh, were made and what backend belongs to each connection. Therefore, we have to implement our own contract. And normally we uh, maintain a single entry per connection which has all the meta information. And if we do the NAT thing, we have one more, one more entry that kind of points to this entry for the reverse traffic. So in this case, the kernel's contract is pretty much irrelevant. That's not the source of the truth. When you dump the contract, then this would be a single line, but it wouldn't fit uh, on the screen. Uh, each uh, contract entry is keyed by the five tuple and it carries the information about the connection. In this case, it was a TCP connection that we have seen to be open and then we have also seen that it's been closed and then we maintain like uh, how long ago and when it was active so that we can garbage collect the information from, from the contract table. If you would have nothing like in this case then in addition to uh, that entry I described before, you would have another entry which is keyed by the pre tuple and it carries the key of the matching entry with the post DNA tuple and carries various flags. But in our project, we kind of don't believe that everything has to be done in eBPF and there are certain things that certain other technologies do better. So in this case, for instance, uh, Linux is much better in doing SNET. It's much better than doing masquerading and can do it in a safe way. So when you have pods that are connecting to the outside world, uh, in Calico you can annotate their IP pools with the fact that these are going to go outside and we want to translate the addresses so that the uh, traffic can reach those pods. Uh, so in this case, we just let the packets into the Linux kernel, into the IP tables, and let the IP tables do uh, what they can do and, uh, and what they can do better than what we can do. And in this case, Linux is obviously maintaining connection tracking, so you will see those uh, contracts. But in our contract, we also have to mark the connection like yeah, when you see the packets from this connection, just let it go, let it, let it go through. Uh, one of the uh, more important features that you can get or the, the data you can get from the, uh, the data plane is counters. Uh, we dump the counters per interface and you see some obvious things. What is more important here is uh, the error cases. If something's going wrong and you see that the error cases are uh, non-zero, that's kind of give you a hint that something's going wrong, right? And at some point, Linux kernel change how the IP, the IP devices look like, and then we got connections broken and suddenly we've seen that there are malformed IP packets because previously one side of the IP IP would get just the IP header and the other side would get also the ethernet header and then it changed and suddenly the packets were Ooh. 
So uh, in that case, we immediately spotted what the problem was, and uh, we could mitigate the problem with uh, with a fix for certain uh, kernel versions. Uh, I haven't mentioned it during the policy dump, but we also maintain counters for every rule. So if you dump the policies, you will also get like how many packets hit every single rule, and that can give you some picture of how packets are flowing through the policies and whether they're hitting the policies that uh, you expected them to hit. And the ultimate option is logging. You can turn on uh, debug login, but then you kind of get like a fire hose of logs from all the devices. But it gives you like a super fine-grained uh, information about what's going on with every packet. And it's also the piece of the information that the user came to me yesterday because in that kind of yellowish part uh, where in this case we uh, have a packet which is not hitting any service, his packet was hitting a service but was not hitting a backend. Uh, so we kind of knew where to, where to take uh, the debugging from further. Uh, and because it's a fire hose, we, what we've introduced and we have a pending PR for that is uh, kind of PCAP TCP dump style filters that would only allow you to filter those packets that you are really interested in because the fire hose in the production server, that's a big overhead. All that stuff goes into a trace pipe and that's not super, uh, super fast. So this is a pending uh, uh, change. And that brings me to what kind of lies in the future of the BPF data plane. We're currently redesigning the, the data plane so that we can load uh, the programs faster because verifier is great, but it's also bloody slow. Uh, so we can't load that many programs. And that kind of lies the framework for uh, more flexible feature expansion uh, and will allow us to, for instance, merge those uh, selective logs. And you have to admit it, we still don't support IPv6 in the BPF mode, but this will allow us to also support IPv6 and IPv4, 6 uh, dual stack. So in conclusion, uh, eBPF is a great tool, uh, very flexible, very powerful. Uh, we love working with that. And in our enterprise offering, we actually use eBPF to much more like runtime security. Uh, but it also disturbs how the packets flow through the system when the BPF is applied to the data plane. So uh, we need to have new tools and users need to understand how these things have changed. And I hope that this talk contributes a little bit uh, to that education aspect. And I would invite you everybody to use uh, Calico and pick the data plane that suits your needs the best because each of the data planes has its pros and cons and uh, we support more than one. Thank you very much. Go. Yes, that's uh, contributed. That's a v uh, is there a user space uh, data plane for Calico coming up? Uh, it's already there. It's contributed by Cisco. It's not maintained by us uh, per se as a company. Uh, and yeah, it's it's fast processing user space special cases. Uh, another question I've seen. If there are no questions, you can uh, catch me later. <laughs>